drinking Estrachi here. Yes, I'm back drinking a Modelo. It is a summer Sunday evening. Twilight is upon us soon. And I felt like talking about these two albums. That's right. Fly on the wall and blow up your video. These albums, they, they don't get enough respect in my opinion. That's putting it lightly. Many people, yes, many people actually think these are two bad albums and they're often cited as two of the worst ACDC albums ever. Yeah, obviously I do not think this and that is why I'm answering the question in the thumbnail right now. Yeah, this ain't a slump at all. If you're disappointed that I think these two albums are awesome, then step off. This video isn't for you, but thank you for clicking. If you want to hear why I think these two albums are awesome and give an in-depth review of both of them, then stick around. You might enjoy it. I have talked about both these albums before. In the past, I've done both a straightforward ACDC discography review, and subsequent to that, I did a Rankorama, a Rankorama where I ranked all of ACDC albums in a Rankorama order, and Fly on a Wall was very high. Blow up your video, was it? It was number 13. Still not the worst by any means. I always had some mixed feelings about Blow Up Your Video, but I was wrong. I was wrong. I finally embraced my love of that album, and I'm gonna talk about that when we get to that album. But we're gonna hit Fly on the Wall first, because that came out first. That's just science. I was at first thinking about making this a just a total mid to late 80s ACDC review, and also talk about Flick of the Switch, the mighty Flick of the Switch. But I decided, you know, Flick of the Switch, despite its connection with Fly on the Wall, which I will talk about, I feel like Flick of the Switch has a fairly strong cult following these days. Yes, it's mainly amongst hardcore ACDC fans. It's very common amongst hardcore ACDC fans to profess your love of Flick of the Switch. It's, it's a very well thought of album. These days. A lot of people cite it as one of the best Brian Johnson era ACDC albums. In fact, I know quite a few people that think it's the best one. I myself would definitely put For Those About to Rock and Back in Black and maybe a couple others before it, but Flick and Switch is awesome, no doubt about it. And I think it's very close in quality to Fly on the Wall, but I actually give Fly on the Wall a slight edge, which I'll explain why. Flick and Switch does have some things going for it that Fly doesn't, namely Phil Rudd plays on it and you could say it has a better production. So essentially, because Flick of the Switch has this cult following, I decided it didn't need a champion. It didn't need me talking about how awesome it is, because most ACDC fans, the real ones, I'm not talking about posers here, but real ACDC fans know Flick of the Switch is awesome. There's no debate about it. Plus, the band themselves seem to have endorsed it, even though the album was considered a commercial and critical disappointment at the time. It's gone platinum like every ACDC album. Platinum. They're all platinum because they're the greatest rock and roll band of all time. That's why all their albums are platinum. Malcolm Young and Brian Johnson have both stated in past interviews that they thought Flick of the Switch was their most underrated album and they talked highly of it and the raw approach that they were going for. And in this awesome video compilation, Plug Me In, yes this one, Flick of the Switch was very well represented. They showed a lot of live clips from it. That in itself was an endorsement. Plus, they even had Guns For Hire was on the Iron Man 2 soundtrack. So it seems like Flick of the Switch has been canonized as an important part of the ACDC discography, even though they still never play any songs from it live, which is too bad because I think, I think a lot of people would dig hearing like Nervous Shakedown or Guns For Hire live. But hey, that's just me. Very least from a retrospective perspective, they are not acting like the album didn't exist. You can't say the same about Fly on the Wall and Blow Up Your Video, which are not featured on Plug Me In. Yeah, yeah, no live clip of them doing Heat Seeker or Nick of Time, wouldn't that be awesome? No live clip of them doing Fly on the Wall in Sync the Pink, even though they fucking scorched live. Thank God for YouTube. More on those great live Fly on the Wall clips in a second. But yeah, so the band kind of act like those two albums don't exist. Even though Blow Up Your Video was a success at the time and considered a bit of a commercial and critical comeback, that definitely helped set up the even bigger comeback of The Razor's Edge. But that's been kind of forgotten in history, and now a lot of people write off Blow Up Your Video as 
one of their weakest, if not their weakest album. And Fly on the Wall has also kind of become a bit of a butt of a joke, like an album that people throw out as an example of a subpar ACDC album. It does have a small cult following, which I've noticed. I've noticed that Fly on the Wall does have a small cult following of people that are getting into it, kind of like Flick of the Switch did about 20 years ago, but it hasn't quite caught up yet. Hopefully this video will make you finally accept the fact that this is an awesome album and it's all right. It's all right. It's all right to embrace it. It's all right to embrace awesome things. Fly on the wall. Yeah. We're talking about fucking fly on the wall. Check that out. See that fly's ass? Check it out. <laughs> All right, I moved the video. All right, yeah, I had to move the video because I realized that my head would be in the way of this cool graphic. There you go, fly on the wall graphic. There you go. Hey, I've been drinking a bit, but that's all right. It's rock and roll. Ignore that Amazon package you see on the ground. Yeah, yeah, what could be in it? I'll tell you what, anyone that guesses what's in that Amazon box will get a shout out in my next video, all right? So if you guess it right, put it in the comments. This is fun. In the comments section, guess what's in Edwin's Amazon box that was just delivered today. I didn't even open it yet. I had things to do. I had to make this fly on the wall, blow up your video video. So anyway, so I didn't get a chance to open what's in the mystery box. So what's in the mystery Amazon box? I'll tell you, if you guess it right, Mark Daly, I know you want to try. If you guess it right, I will mention your name in the next video. Yes, exciting stuff. So anyway, this album, Fly on the Wall. Another thing I really love about this album is the thing that I think some people don't like about it is its awesome album cover. This could be my favorite ACDC album cover. I mean, it's got wood paneling for one thing. Anyone that knows me knows I love wood paneling. Yes, just like my rock and roll brother, Mick Watkins, who I know also loves Fly on the Wall, and I know he's watching this video. So shout out to you, brother. Yes, Fly on the Wall, wood paneling. I like the, the orange font of, of the ACDC logo. I like, the, I like the mascot. I like the fly mascot. Too bad he didn't catch on. Would have gave Angus a little bit of a break, you know? It's tough being Angus Young. He's both their guitarist and their mascot. What's fucking Eddie do for Iron Maiden? He lumbers around a little bit. But it's not like he's a fucking working member of the band. You ever see Eddie do a guitar solo? No, he does jack shit. He's got no musical talent. Yeah, he looks cool. Eddie looks cool, but he's got no musical talent. Angus Young is a living, breathing fucking mascot that plays the guitar and duck walks all over fucking Eddie's face. Damn. So anyway, this one thing. I talked about this in my Overkill video, and it's a big thing that I love about 80s heavy metal. They were embracing this punk rock aesthetic and there were these Mad Magazine comic book art album covers and, and they were having fun, you know? There wasn't all this stuff where everything had to be really grim or really dark. You know, there was personality in the album covers, both these album covers that we'll be talking about, they got a lot of personality and it adds to the album. And it's not like leaning into like cliche heavy metal shit. Oh, and that's another thing. I consider ACDC very heavy metal during this period. Yeah, I know the band themselves, like Lemmy of Motorhead, they like to call themselves rock and roll. And yeah, they are rock and roll. And heavy metal is a subgenre of rock and roll, in my opinion. So there's your fucking metal pyramid metal nerds. Yeah, it's fucking rock and roll. And then rock and roll branches off to a lot of different subgenres, including heavy metal. And then heavy metal underneath rock and roll branches off in a, a lot of different subgenres of heavy metal. But rock and roll's at the top. So ACDC is a heavy metal band that leaned into their roots, the rock and roll roots, in the same way Motorhead were a heavy metal band that leaned into their roots. They weren't fucking hard rock. Bob Seger and Pat Travers and like Foghat, that's hard rock. ACDC's fucking heavy metal. At least from Let There Be Rock to Fly on the Wall, I consider them a heavy metal band of a rock and roll spirit. Just play Flick of the Switch and Fly on the Wall in mixed company, and suddenly you'll see how hard rock they are. Yeah, it'll scare all the straights away, especially Fly on a Wall. It'll really scare them away. They'll be like, ah, my eardrums hurt. And I love ACDC during this period. Hey, Angus had the really long hair. How fucking metal is that? Look at fucking Angus Young's hair during this period. This is the longest it ever was. And if you see interviews during this time period, he's just real snotty, shaking off all that kind of prankster schoolboy stuff that he did back in the 70s, you know? Now he's just like a mean little guy that has a sardonic sense of humor 
and wants everyone to fuck off and rock and roll. That's his attitude, and that's pretty much what he says. You know, and Brian does his thing like he always does. He's the affable bloke that you want to have a drink with, and Angus is the guy that wants to smoke his ciggy and tell you to fuck off, cunt. I love it. Great dynamic. I love these two guys. They should start a band together. So I like the whole vibe. I love Brian's look during this period. This whole period, which I, I'll call it the Simon Wright era. During the Simon Wright era, Brian pretty much is wearing the same thing all the time. He's got the double denim, which is fucking awesome. Double denim. Like fucking Mr. Majestic. He's got the jeans. He's got like the white shirt underneath. He's got a little bit, a little bit of a beer gut, which is cool. But otherwise he looks pretty... He looks pretty muscular and, and studly. And then he's got the, the fucking denim vest. Denim vest. How fucking badass is that? And then he's got the biggest flat cap of all his flat caps. Like, you know, he wore a nice big one during this period. And he looked fucking awesome because he was awesome. Yes, little known fact, people and things that look awesome oftentimes are. Yes, it's funny how that works out. And nothing. Brian sounds great on this album. Just a lot of people don't realize it because of the wonky mix and production. Reverb. Although not quite as reverby as Blow Up Your Video, more on that later, Fly on a Wall does have more reverb than perhaps it should. Definitely more than the very dry sounding and raw sounding Flick of the Switch. Although this is just as raw. They got a different thing going for now. I think because Flick of the Switch didn't quite do what they were hoping for, but yet they still wanted to kind of hang on to this ethos, this idea that we're going for a raw album. But they were thinking, hey, but maybe we'll try to present a raw album in a slightly different way than we did last time. Like, let's do some production-y stuff. Because Angus and Malcolm are producing this, just like they produced the last one. Part of the reason they did that was because they, they didn't want to keep on making these slick, bigger sounding albums that to them were starting to get, I guess, a little too pop. Talk about being fucking tough customers. They thought For Those About to Rock, We Salute You was too much of a slick pop album for their taste. These are some real fucking down and dirty Aussie blokes. They were like, nah, Mutt Lang is pushing us to be one step, one step away from being Def Lepper. And that's one step too much, motherfucker. We don't want to have a pyromania. I love pyromania. I think it's great. But I think it's also great that ACDC didn't want to do a fucking pyromania. Instead, they did flick it a switch, which is like the anti-pyromania. Even look at the videos during that period. I love this period. But hey, I don't want to talk about flick it a switch. You know it's awesome. You're not entirely convinced about fly on a wall. So let me just say this. If you love Flick of the Switch so much, why don't you love Fly on the Wall? It's like the people that love Back in Black but don't love For Those About to Rock, We Salute You. I don't get that. Those albums sound very similar to me. Likewise, yeah, I guess it's got Simon Wright playing drums and it's got like a bigger drum sound and there's more reverb on this album. But more or less, this is just a raw and loud and heavy, straight up, heavy metal album like Flick of the Switch is. So I, if you love Flick of the Switch, you should love Fly on the Wall. They're like fucking brothers, these albums. Yeah, except for this one has, I think, slightly better songs and definitely better guitar solos. In fact, these are Angus's best guitar solos in the 80s and the best guitar solos he did after Let There Be Rock, in my opinion. Bold statement, not if you actually listen to the fucking album, Bozo. Yeah, listen to those solos. Those solos are amazing. God, the first Blood solo is so fucking awesome. It's like a billion boners exploding in the sun. That's what that solo sounds like. I can't even do it because you'd have to be a fucking crazy Simon Wright era Angus Young to make that fucking sound. It's angry. This whole album just sounds like a big angry hate fuck. But it's kind of like angry and fun. Whereas Flick was just angry. This is angry and fun. I've said it before and I'll say it again. It sounds like a hot, sweaty bar fight in the summertime. And that title track, that title track, Fly on a Walk, goddamn, that's one of the greatest ACDC songs ever. You want to see something awesome, I'm leaving a link down below. Fly on the Wall, the 1985 soundboard video where they took the soundboard recording. This guy did a great job. Sounds great. Sounds better than the album. Yeah, a lot of people say that in the comments section. And I agree. I have grown to love this wonky, hot mess of a production. I think it's an awesome, sludgy wall of sound, not unlike Motorhead's Orgasmatron, another awesome goddamn album. But that live version that you should listen to or watch or both down below 
Sounds even better. And it proves that Brian was still in top form. Yes, in 1985, he was still in top early 80s form, even though it was the mid 80s. God damn it, Brian Johnson. He sounded amazing. He sounds amazing. Just watch that fucking clip of Fly on the Wall. This album actually is a little more bass heavy than Flick of the Switch. That's another reason why I like it a little bit better. You actually hear clip films sometimes, especially if you listen to the vinyl version. Sounds better on vinyl, like everything. Shake Your Foundations, an awesome ACDC classic for super studs. I remember the first time I heard it in Maximum Overdrive when they're fucking up all those evil trucks. Awesome. It makes me want to fuck up some evil trucks. Yeah, they repeat the chorus a few times too many. That's a big 1985 thing. Everyone in 1985 was a little retarded. So they repeated choruses way too often. But it was an awesome kind of retardation. It makes you want to smash beer cans on each other's heads and keep repeating the fucking chorus until the fucking end of the world. First Blood. It has nothing to do with the Sylvester Stallone movie, First Blood, which is also awesome. So they do have that in common, that they're both awesome and they're both called First Blood. But this song is not about a crazy Vietnam vet. No, it's not about that. It's about, I don't know, it just sounds like it's about fucking, like most ACDC songs. Thank God for that, because that's what rock and roll is supposed to be about. True story. Some people don't like the lyrics in this song. I've heard it. I've even a few times in my life said, oh, that line when Brian Johnson sings, some like it hot, some like it quite not so hot. One thing you're missing out on is that Brian actually laughs. You hear his laughter. Yeah, listen, listen. Listen with your fucking ears, people. He laughs. That means he knows it's a silly line. It's a toss-off line. Like, they're just coming up with this shit in the studio. It's improvisation, man. It's rock and roll. They're just having fun. Fucking ODB used to rap like that all the time. He'd get drunk. Yeah, ODB of the Wu-Tang. Recognize. Wu-Tang Clan, who are the ACDC of rap. And likewise, awesome. ODB would a lot of times rap a word and rhyme it with the same word because he was fucking drunk, but he made it work. He made it funky and awesome. And that's what Brian Johnson's doing here. It sounds awesome. The song is so badass, not to mention, here's another thing. Power Edge is my favorite ACDC album. And yes, the lyrics are great on that album. But for the most part, for the most part, do you listen to ACDC for the fucking lyrics? No. Watch my ACDC Bon Scott wrote back in black conspiracy theory videos. For more on that, all right? I don't want to get too into that because I already have a four-part video series about that topic. But all I will just say is no one fucking listens to ACDC for the lyrics. And if they say they do, they're fucking full of shit, all right? ACDC, like Malcolm Young himself said back in the day, the great Malcolm Young said, it's not about thinking the, this music. It's about fucking, all right? That's rock and roll. They're taking not just from early rock and roll, but early blues, like the holy trifecta of John Lee Hooker, Muddy Waters, and Howlin' Wolf. And those guys have very straightforward, macho lyrics, sometimes even a little repetitive. Yes, but they were awesome. They were just strutting around with a lot of machismo and talking about how they were going to fuck up everyone that got in their way and fuck all the ladies. And then sometimes those ladies would make them sad if they were fucking around on them. But more or less, it was just a big fuck fest. That's what it was about. I love intelligent lyrics from time to time, but there's a time for that and there's a time for fucking and that's where a fly on the wall comes in. I assume even the title track, that's some kind of innuendo. It must be a glory hole or something like a fly going through the hole, which is like their collective dick, the collective ACDC dick, a heat seeker, more on that later. Anyway, First Blood's awesome. If you don't love it, I'm taking away your fucking rock and roll card. Yeah, that's right. I'm keeping it. Maybe I'll give it to the person who guesses correctly what's in my fucking Amazon box. Danger! You might think this song sucks, but guess what? It doesn't. In your face, it's awesome. Danger, I used to think sucked. Yeah, I admit it, but no, it's awesome. It's great. It has this little weird effect that you would never hear from an ACDC song before or after. It's like, wonk, 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 wonk. It's kind of funky. It's kind of funky. Sounds almost like something like Prince would do. I like it. It's cool. It's not a ballad, but it's just kind of a weird mid-tempo song that sounds like nothing ACDC would ever do again or afterwards. And that's another thing I love about this period, the Simon Wright era, is that they're experimenting. They're doing things that are a little different. You would not hear that again from the band subsequent to this. Maybe 
a few songs here and there, like on Ball Breaker or Power Up. But for the most part, they, they played it pretty safe once they got into the 90s and on. But here, they're still experimenting. They're still trying different things. Some people thought Danger didn't work. I don't know, I think it works. I also think it's Brian's best lyrics on the album. Red lights are flashing. There's been a misunderstanding. I'm bruised, broken, bandaged through drinking all that brandy. And you know what's awesome? This is some real ODB shit. Brian Johnson effectively rhymes bandaged with brandy. Yeah, he does it. He makes them sound like they rhyme. That's a real fucking singer, man. Awesome shit. And then, oh my God, when you get to that last line, I was just raising hell. I wasn't doing no harm. The cops could not appreciate my natural charm. You tell me if Bon Scott wrote those lyrics and sang those lyrics, you wouldn't be talking about how awesome and witty they were? Of course you would be. Don't be a fake poser. Love Brian and Bon because they're both awesome. And these lyrics are awesome. Overall, I think these are probably the weakest lyrics Brian wrote in the 80s. And yes, I think he wrote all the lyrics in the 80s with help from the Young Brothers. More on that in that other video series. But still, I think he added a working class edge and macho quality that I feel is lacking after the Young Brothers, because they were greedy motherfuckers, pushed him out of the lyric writing. Although they're greedy motherfuckers, I do love them though. No disrespect, but they're kind of like gangsters. That's what makes them awesome. Then we got Sink the Pink. How could you not love Sink the Pink? It's a fucking ACDC classic. This should be like on every jukebox. This should be in movies. Oh, it was in one awesome movie, Maximum Overdrive. Great coked up Stephen King directed film involving cool motherfucking trucks running over people and shit, including that really badass Green Goblin truck. Now that is awesome. The only thing more awesome than a Green Goblin truck is fucking Sink the Pink. God damn, that song's great. A bona fide classic. As good as anything on Back in Black. Yes, I said it. It's awesome. Listen to that solo. That solo is one of the greatest Angus Young solos ever up there. But what's even better is when you flip the record over and you got Playing With Girls, Playing With Girls. God damn, my favorite song on the album. If you don't like Playing With Girls, give me that other spare rock and roll card you got. Yeah, yeah, I'm keeping that one too. You don't deserve it. Playing with girls. It's like a mean, badass Zeppelin riff. Yeah. Jimmy Page would listen to this song and would go, these guys got it. They know what they're doing. Love it. Dan, 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 dan. Both hard rocking and funky at the same time. I love when shit is hard rocking and funky at the same time. Brian screaming his fucking balls off. I love it. And when his balls fly off, they grow back again, but even bigger and stronger than before. Stand Up, nah, not one of the best songs on the album, but it has grown on me. I like that guitar riff in the beginning. Sounds like Journey's Wheel in the Sky. And I like songs that sound like Wheel in the Sky. Hell or High Water, okay, the weakest song on the album, but it doesn't suck. It's a little repetitive. Sounds kind of like mid 80s Kiss. I can roll with it, not bad, but the side isn't quite as strong as the first side, but it gets awesome again. Back in business. What do you know? They're back in business. We're back in business. Love this song. I love that whole fly on the wall video, by the way. They did this video where it was like five songs and they were all at a bar. It's like the first time ACDC kind of gave in a little bit to this idea that they should have a concept in their videos. So they did this whole thematic video about them in the bar and there's these shady characters and there's a little cartoon fly flying around. It's fun. I dig it. It's cheesy in the best mid-80s way. And for the most part, I think the songs that they picked to play that could be then broken up into individual videos for MTV, I think were spot on. The only one I object to is Stand Up. I don't think Stand Up was strong enough. It shouldn't have made the cut. In my opinion, the song that should have made the cut and been part of that video and had a sequence was this one, Back in Business. I think there's a missed opportunity here because this is the mid-80s. This is when ZZ Top was hot on MTV. And that's a great thing because ZZ Top's awesome. Watch my ZZ Top video if you want to know more about that. But yeah, back in business, great ZZ Top sounding, bluesy, hard rocking song. Very catchy, very catchy. I love the chorus. I love the way the band sounds. The backing vocals, the gang vocals, their best gang vocals ever. Back in business again. Charges you up. It makes you want to get back in business again. Should have been a single. And then the grand finale. Send for the man. 
so fucking awesome. One of my favorite closing numbers on an ACDC album. So dark and meaty sounding, kind of a dark bluesy song, but with a few mid 80s heavy metal chants in it. Foreshadows their ball breaker sound a little bit. Not a bad thing because ball breaker is likewise awesome. Check out the link down below if you want to hear me and my rock and roll brother, Eric Jordan RMCP, and my main man, Samuel Wetz, talking about the ball breaker album. It's a great episode, so check that out if you want to give it a listen. But yes, and for the man, a foreshadowing of Ball Breaker excellence on an excellent album called Fly on the Wall. I love this album. I love it. Hot, angry, ballsy sound. Like I said, this is a dividing line in the sand kind of album. It's like, are you into ACDC because you want to hear the groove and the rawness and the bashing guitars and the chants and the fucking grooves and guitar solos and the shrieking, raspy vocals? Or do you want to analyze the lyric writing of Von Scott, who I love? who was a great lyricist, but Brian's a damn good one too. And you know what? For the purposes of ACDC's music, they don't need to be better. In fact, I feel it's a little more raw and straight up if they're a little dumber, the lyrics. Yeah, cleverness sometimes gets in the way of rock and roll. This is like the id of ACDC. ACDC's an id band to begin with. So there's like an id underneath the fucking id. And that id, underneath the id, is a fucking fly on the wall. Before we get into blow up your video though, I have to discuss it. I have to discuss it because it's the bridge between fly on the wall and blow up your video. This album, Who Made Who? First day CDC album I ever bought. It's awesome. What's up with Angus's really colorful, goofy looking hat? I don't know, I love it, I love it. I don't care if that's goofy. I like that's a little different. Cool video too with the robots and shit. Love it. Of course, that was the soundtrack for Stephen King's great coked up killer truck movie, Maximum Overdrive. Who made who? I will say this. As much as I love dumbed down fly on the wall lyrics and I want to get into it, I do occasionally don't mind a few, few little introspective lyrics thrown into my rock and roll. If truth be told, I like both. I'm an open-minded cat. But the thing is, the Young Brothers and Johnson couldn't do that on their own. And it's not the Bon Scott conspiracy I'm talking about. It's the conspiracy that ACDC need top producers who are also songwriters to help them write songs that are a little more complicated and have slightly superior lyrics. Mott Lang, for example, did that with even the great Bon Scott. Listen to some of those early tracks from Highway to Hell on the Bonfire box set, or even like Dirty Eyes before it became a whole lot of Rosie. George Young, who was also a songwriter, songwriter for the Easy Beats in the Young Brothers, Older Brothers, and Mentor, he was a songwriter. Mott Lang was also a songwriter. He helped co-write most of Def Leppard's biggest hits. So yes, when they worked with Mutt Lang, when they worked with George Young, Harry Vonda, they had help with the songwriting. The Young Brothers liked to play this down. They especially played it down when it was Mutt Lang because he wasn't blood. And they're like the mafia. They're like, he's not blood. Fuck him for helping us write hit songs. We don't want his help. We'd rather write albums that aren't as successful without him. That'll show him. That'll show him. But when it came time to write a song for a Stephen King killer truck movie, they were like, shit, we need a little bit of help here. All right, so George Young and Harry Vonda return. First time producing something with Brian Johnson and Simon Wright. And this is Simon Wright's finest moment. Fucking DT. If you don't love DT, all right, come on. I know you're holding out on me. You got that third rock and roll card. Yeah, get out of here. Bunch of fucking rock and roll cards now in my fucking pocket. So yeah, Who Made Who is a fucking amazing song. One of the greatest ACDC songs ever. Why don't they play this live? ACDC does a disservice to the fucking Brian Johnson era because they don't play fucking gems like Sink the Pink and Guns for Hire and Who Made Who and perhaps some songs we're going to get to on the next album. Anyway, yeah, if you were listening to Who Made Who, some young person was listening to this song, they'd go, hey, this is fucking great. I love this song. It's really catchy. It's very melodic. And it has very clever lyrics, very clever lyrics that I think Brian and the boys had some help with from George Young and Harry Vonda. It worked. It sounded great. This album was a slight comeback after the last two. By the way, every album, Fly on the Wall, did a little bit better in Flick of the Switch. 
who made who did a little bit better in fly on the wall, and then blow up your video did better in all of them. So they were kind of gradually working their way to the big comeback that would inevitably be the Razor's Edge. And man, they toured a lot. They toured for this. They toured for essentially an album that was a soundtrack album, one new song and two instrumentals. And the two instrumentals, they didn't play live. So essentially, it was just like they kept touring for Fly on the Wall, but took off two Fly on the Wall songs and added Who Made Who. And She's Got Balls, which is a weird song to play on that tour. But they played it. Yeah, check out that set list. So I think this is actually when Brian kind of shot out his voice. I used to think it was on Flick and Switch, but then when I heard the soundboard recording of Fly on the Wall Live and watched other Fly on the Wall Live clips and then really listened to the Fly on the Wall album, and I could really make out how great Brian sounded. I was like, no, nah, his voice was still in great shape. I think it was forcing this guy to keep singing like this for another year. He didn't even have a break. In 1986, they were just back on tour again. So yeah, so by the time he gets to blow up your video, his voice is a, it's a little shot. Still awesome, but a little shot. More on that later. But he sounds great on Who Made Who. Some of their best lyrics ever. As clever as anything on a Bon Scott song. I love it. And it's a great compilation. It's not like a proper best of. It leans into the Brian Johnson era. And it's got two fly on the wall songs. But remixes. This is Harry Vonda and George Young remixing the songs. Sink the Pink doesn't sound that different. Shake Your Foundations is far more noticeably different. I actually like what they did. I think they, they tightened up the song a little bit. And created a little more of a build up in the beginning. But I kind of like the fatness of the original one. They kind of rein in that fat, heavy sound of Fly on the Wall. And unfortunately, they would continue to do this with the next album. Here we go. Blow up your video. Blow it up. Finish watching my video first, though. Then blow it up. Awesome album. All these albums sound better on vinyl. In fact, it was listening to Blow Up Your Video on vinyl, which I got, I only got that like a couple of years ago when I first got the vinyl. That's what made me really start to reappraise this album. Because even though I always loved Flick of the Switch and Fly on the Wall and Who Made Who, I used to always, uh, I never hated Blow Up Your Video and I never said it was the worst. I always preferred it to The Razor's Edge, which is my least favorite ACDC album. And I always talked up the songs. I always could hear that these were good songs and the songwriting was very strong. In fact, I think they're the best lyrics of the Brian Johnson era. And I do think Brian was writing a lot of these lyrics with help from the Young Brothers and George Young and Harry Bonda. I think it's a team effort. And I think they all together came up with some great lyrics. And I think they're better than any of the lyrics they would have on subsequent albums after the Young Brothers squeezed out Brian Johnson. So I do think Brian Johnson added an edge in a real world quality that was lacking in their later work. I could always hear the lyrics were good. I could always hear his good songs but as I even said in that ACDC Rankarama and why I at the time ranked it at 13 I thought the album was weaker from a sonic standpoint and it didn't sound as heavy as their prior albums and Brian sounded a little shot and god damn there's a lot of reverb on this album but you know what yeah I mean the reverb does kind of take away the sonic power of the band and yeah I would love to hear this remixed and mixed more in a Mutt Lang style god imagine if you had like a Mutt Lang back in black sounding production with these songs oh my god it'd be awesome but we're going to like it for what it is it is a wonky production and and as many of you know I like a wonky production it has a character I will say this in a way and maybe to a degree they were going for this it reminds me a little of the those like early 50s records and Sun Records which have a, a lot of reverb like you hear a lot of reverb on like Jerry Lee Lewis like a whole lot of shaking going on something that Phil Spector liked to emulate in a lot of his productions as well so in a way I guess you can see this is kind of like the Phil Spector ACDC album there's a quality to it it's not quite the sound you want from ACDC and I don't even think necessarily it's the best for this album like maybe Razor's Edge could have used it this the songs are so good that I didn't think we needed the experimental reverb echo chamber on this one it does sound better on vinyl and it does bring out a rock and roll quality so if the fly on the wall is a hot sweaty heavy metal album for rock and roll soul this is more of a cool relaxed rock and roll album with a heavy metal soul all right and i've grown to like it yeah i've grown to actually like this production for what it is i don't think it's necessarily the best production this album could have but it's got character it's got personality and they take chances they take musical chances and they take a lot of musical chances on this album in a way that they never would again in my opinion and brian yes brian does sound a little shot but 
Still sounds a lot better than he sounds on Razor's Edge, in my opinion. He still sounds cool, and the reverb really kind of works with his vocals in a way. Whereas with Fly on the Wall, I kind of wish they weren't there because he sounds so great. Here, I think the reverb's kind of helping him a bit. It's kind of like how the reverb helps, kind of helps Lana Del Rey. You know, it gives her some more personality in the studio. When you hear her live, yeah, she doesn't sound that great. But in the studio, she sounds like this great, sultry, reverb-drenched siren. And Brian Johnson sounds kind of like the macho fucking dad rock version of that. And I love it. Heat Seeker, yeah, buddy. How could you not love Heat Seeker? You know, this and another song, That's the Way I Want to Rock and Roll, were played on the Razor's Edge tour. Yeah, they were carryovers. In fact, Heat Seeker's even on the single disc version of Live, along with Who Made Who. Why do I bring this up? I bring this up because ACDC claims they don't play Who Made Who and Heat Seeker and Songs from This Air because fans wouldn't know it. Oh, really? Fans wouldn't know two songs that are on the single live album release, which a lot of people bought as a proxy to a greatest hits in the 90s. I don't buy it. Fake news. Fake news from the young family. I don't trust those guys, even though they're fucking awesome. Yeah, that's bullshit. If they played Heat Seeker and Who Made Who, people would know it from the live album. Just like a lot of people in the 80s knew those Bon Scott era songs because of If You Want Blood, You Got It. Yeah, the band is making a choice of what is a staple and what's not. It's a choice. It's a choice to stop playing Who Made Who and Heat Seeker. It's not the fans. It's ACDC. Come on, Angus. Give the real fans something they want to hear. Give them some more from this era. Yeah, Heat Seeker. It's great phallic symbol, just like the best ACDC phallic symbols. And it's a lot of fun. Kind of a bright and happy sounding chord progression. A little different for them. A little modern sounding while not sacrificing their true ACDC spirit. It doesn't sound like late 80s hair metal, but it does kind of sound like late 80s hair metals going on around it, if you know what I mean. The way the Highway to Hell didn't sound like disco, but it sounded like disco was going on around it. In the same way, Ball Breaker wasn't grunge, but it sounded like grunge was going on around it. Sometimes the times seep in a little bit onto an ACDC album. And this one, yeah, definitely sounds like the late 80s is seeping in. But yet, there's no concessions, there's no power ballot, there's no keyboard, it's still a straight up ACDC album. One that's just clearly written and recorded in 1988. And I love that they're progressing and trying different things and different sounds to new slick, modern, futuristic kind of rock and roll. It sounds like the band that did Who Made Who went and then did a whole album of Who Made Who's. How awesome is that? I love that band that did Who Made Who. I would love to hear a whole album from that band. And what do you know? That's blow up your video. So there you go. And yeah, Simon Wright, he's no Phil Rudd, but he's definitely better than Chris Slade. Yeah, I said it. He sounds like a human being. So right there, he's got one up on Chris Slade in that regard. And he's got a groove, not a Phil Rudd groove, but he's got this nice kind of fucking John Bottom groove, good bass drum. He locks in there. I like Simon Wright. He's definitely the second best drummer ACDC ever had. And he did a good job on this album as well, playing a little different, playing with a little bit of a, a little bit of a swing on this one. Definitely hearing him. That's the way I want to rock and roll. Very Zeppelin-ish. Lot of fun. Love this song. Very catchy. Mean Streak, though. Oh, Mean Streak. This song's so funky and down and dirty. Really love Brian's vocals on it. Yeah, they might be scrappy and kind of a little war-torn. And it sounds like he's got like fucking gravel in his mouth and whiskey and cigarettes. And they're all just rolling around in his mouth. And that's like how those old blues cats sounded. That's like what Howlin' Wolf sounded like. It's awesome. I love it. Mean Streak sounds like it could be a fucking 50s or 60s blues song, but also with a little bit of a funk groove. Also a lot like 70s Aerosmith. And again, not quite like anything they would ever do before or after. Still experimenting, still doing different things, finding different ways to express their fucking rock and roll souls. Badass song. And also great lyrics. You want to hear some more great lyrics? All right. Mean Streak by Young Young and Johnson. Eaten rich, yeah, and I've eaten free, and I'm the perfect culture vulture in the face of poverty. Come on, come on, again. If Bon Scott wrote his lyrics, you would be saying how clever they were. Culture vulture, that's some good shit. I love it. And this is the thing that Brian Johnson could bring to the song with that working class edge, like Bon Scott also had. 
Because like Bon Scott, he was a guy that did some hard labor. Brian Johnson actually did even more. He was taking windscreens out of people's cars late at night during pouring rain. So when he gets fucking paid, when it's his fucking payday, it's like the Wu-Tang. He's fucking drinking that brandy and smoking the big fat fucking cigars. It's big time. He's going to enjoy it because he busted his ass for years. Yeah, denying the joys of luxury is a luxury for the rich. Us poor people that get rich fucking love it and we embrace it because we know how much it sucks not to have it. Yeah, go zone. It's the weakest song on the album, I will say that, but I have grown to like it. I love that little breakdown, that cool little Angus finger tapping breakdown. Brian sounds cool in it, and I, I like the word go zone. Now, they recorded a lot of songs during this. It's actually an unusual thing for ACDC to have a lot of B-sides and unreleased tracks from albums. Normally, they ran a pretty tight ship. It's unusual for them, but this album, this is like the only album where they had a lot of tracks that they recorded and didn't make the cut. And a lot of these, Borrowed Time, Snake Eye, Snake Eye's really great. It was the B-side to Heat Seeker, which I thought was a little bit better in this song. I would say Go Zone and Borrowed Time are about of the same quality. What totally should have took its place, though, was Down on the Borderline. I love Down on the Borderline. Angus does some amazing guitar playing on it, and it's just a great song, really catchy. To me, Down on the Borderline definitely should have made the cut and not Go Zone. That's the only thing I would actually change about this album. And, well, maybe maybe take down the, the reverb just a touch, just a touch. But still, I like Go Zone. Not bad. Love the next track, Kissin' Dynamite. Badass song. Very interesting chords. A little jazzy. A little jazzy sounding, but still very heavy. And I love the way it builds up. To me, better than TNT. Yeah, I said it. This is like the more evolved, grown-up TNT. Yeah, that was for the boys. This is for the men. Kissin' Dynamite. Sounds badass. I love it. It sounds like it could be a fucking cool 70s Clint Eastwood movie. Yeah, love it. But the second side, second side is where this takes off. Unlike Fly on the Wall, which I think had a superior first side, this has a superior second side. Even though those first three tracks were great, and I love Kissing Dynamite. But this second side, it starts off with my favorite song on the album, Nick of Time. Amazing song. One of my favorite ACDC songs. They actually played it during this tour. Great song. Very different. Again, very progressive by ACDC standards. Like, no, it's not Rush, but... This is like as rush as ACDC gets. Like they're really stretching themselves here. And this feels kind of like they're kind of picking up, kind of musically picking up from where For Those About to Rock left off. Where Flick of the Switch and Fly on the Wall was them rejecting that progression and going, potentially going for something more straight up and raw and simplistic. This is them deciding that, nah, we can be a little clever again musically. We can stretch ourselves. We can be a little more modernist with our approach. And you hear it throughout Nick of Time. Definitely should have been like you used in a movie. I could hear it like being used in a late 80s action film. It's just got a great energy to it, a great feel. I always love this song. Brian sounds great on it. I would say it's probably his best vocal performance on the album. And god damn, how could you not love Nick at Time? You've been holding out. You've been holding out. You got another one? You got Give me that one. Give me that rock and roll card. No more. Get out of here. Out. You don't love Nick of Time. You don't deserve. You don't deserve those fucking rock and roll cards, bozo. <laughs> Nick of Time. Awesome fucking song. Fucking rocker for the ages. But then we get to my second favorite song on the album. God damn. It's like this is a great album or something. Some Sin for Nothing. By far the best lyrics ever on a Brian Johnson era album. This is almost as good as the lyrics Bon Scott wrote on Powerage, which I still think are the best lyrics on an ACDC album. But these, these are up there. It's very catchy and infectious and smart and not quite as repetitive lyrically as they were on Flick and Fly. Again, probably help from the producers and their mentor songwriting brother, older brother George Young. But listen to these lyrics. Some sin for gold. Some sin for shame, some sin for cash, some sin for gain, some sin for wine, some sin for pain, but I ain't gonna be the fool who's gonna have to sin for nothing.
It's an interesting concept, the idea of sinning for nothing, that you would be doing these things, but they don't lead to anything, some end goal. This shows, and this is back to like this mean streak persona of someone who's like a hustler on the streets trying to get something out from someone. This hustler on the streets that's always like working some angle. It's very streetwise and smart. This is a great example of wordplay. Like they're using the word sin as a verb. Generally, people would use it as a, a noun or sinful as an adjective. But here, sin is being used as a verb in a more biblical sense. This is like Dylan-level lyrics. Yeah, yeah, I'm fucking blow up your video. Fucking recognize. And you know what? You don't have lyrics quite this good again after Brian Johnson's name is no longer part of the songwriting credits. Just saying, just saying. And musically, bluesy, badass. This is actually a song where I think the reverb really isn't an atmosphere. It sounds like a kind of late night at a bar where you hung around a little bit too long. A lot of people sinning for nothing around you. Some shit's about to get real. Fucking love it. Great song. And then maybe my fourth favorite song on the album. Rough Stuff. Rough Stuff is awesome. And here, this was the biggest ball drop of ACDC's fucking big bald career. Rough Stuff totally should have been a single and had an awesome video. Like, what the fuck? This song is like, you shook me all night long level catchiness. And in 1988, in 1988, ACDC with a sexy, hot, rough stuff video that had some sexy women like in the You Shook Me All Night Long video. Hell, make it like a sequel video with the same blonde chick, that model. I love her, British model. There she is. Check her out, boys. Yeah, she should have returned for the rough stuff video. Could have been like part two. It would have been awesome. It's just got such a catchy chorus. Give me that rough stuff. -na 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 -na. I want some rough stuff. -na 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 -na. Catchy fucking shit. Yeah. Catchier than money talks, in my opinion. So why wasn't this released as a single? Didn't you guys want to make this album even bigger? It did well. It went platinum at the time. It was their biggest selling album since For Those About to Rock, We Salute You. It totally set up the bigger comeback of The Razor's Edge. But that's something that's a little forgotten in history. And Blow Up Your Video actually even had some good reviews. Like, we give a shit what the critics say anyway. But if you do, this album at the time actually had some good reviews. But now, in retrospect, critics dismiss it. I feel like if they had one really big hit from this album, I feel like people would have looked back at it differently. I mean, look at the fucking Razor's Edge with that slick fucking dated production and all those filler tracks, but because we got Thunderstruck and Money Talks, people like think of that as a bigger album. Casual fans, anyway. And I'm just saying, as strong as Heat Seeker and That's the Way I Want to Rock and Roll are, Rough Stuff was clearly the single. Yeah, that was the single. And they didn't release it. Massive fail, ACDC. Should have been a single. Regardless, even if it's the great single that never was, I love Rough Stuff. It kicks ass. Then we get to maybe uh, my third favorite song on the album. Yeah. Two's Up. God damn it. How could you not love Two's Up? Last two tracks is where this album suddenly gets very heavy metal. For the most part, I thought this album was veering away from the heavy metal quality of Flick of the Switch and Fly on the Wall and going a little more into the hard rock direction that they would go into even further as they got older. But these two songs here are very 80s heavy metal. And that's awesome, especially if you love 80s heavy metal. Two's Up. Great sounding song. Definitely some sexual innuendo here. Better than the Jack. Yeah, I said it. Two's up is better than the Jack. What a fucking awesome song. Love the darkness to it. The meatiness. Angus's solo. One of his greatest guitar solos. It's so great. It's almost like one of those guitar solos on Fly on the Wall. I love the guitar solo. I love the way Brian... Oh, Brian sounds really great on this. This might be his second or third best vocals after Nick of Time and Some Sin for Nothing. He sounds really cool and raspy and just like a mean fucking badger that's going to give you a twos up or you're going to give him a twos up or you're both going to give other people twos ups or whatever. I don't know if you know what twos up is about. Leave a comment down below. I just know it's some sexy fucking shit and it means something. Twos up's awesome. And if you're awesome and you're a super stud and usually super studs are awesome, then you already love twos up. Then we get to the last track. Another awesome track. Maybe my I don't know, fifth favorite song? I don't know, they're all fucking awesome. All these songs on the second side. This means war. Great way to end the album. This is like a prototype of Thunderstruck. You hear the din -din 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 except for it's far more awesome. Yes, yeah, far more awesome than Thunderstruck. Thunderstruck is for jocks. 
This means war is for headbanging scumbags. Yes, and that's why it's cooler. ACDC's not heavy metal. Play This Means War the next time you gotta be around a bunch of basic people. Yeah, play This Means War. You'll find out how fucking heavy metal it is really quick. Ryan sounds really cool and tough here. In a way, he's making his voice something he would do to great effect on the Ball Breaker album. He's taking the fact that his voice is a little shattered, a little ravaged, a little bruised and battered. He's making it sound cool. Again, like those great blues cats from the 50s and 60s and even into the 70s, like when Muddy Waters did Hard Again. A big influence on the Young Brothers. Fucking Hard Again. By that point, Muddy Waters, he'd been around the block for a few decades. He just sounded like a tough old motherfucker. And Brian's not even old yet. But he already sounds like, God damn it, these last eight years of ACDC, he sounds like he was really living it up. And this means war. It's got energy. It's fun. It's hot. It's speedy. This is the ACDC of Let There Be Rock. The ACDC of Riff Raff. The ACDC of Shake a Leg. The ACDC of Landslide and Brain Shake. The ACDC of Playing with Girls. This is the fucking ACDC I love. The fucking bawling, speedy, heavy metal ACDC with the rock and roll soul. This means war. I love it. I hate real life war, but I love fucking rock and roll heavy metal war. Yeah. And like I said, this album did really well. And during this whole period, this period which is considered like a slump by some people, all these albums eventually went platinum. Pull up your video and went platinum actually then, back then in the late 80s. And they were always a headliner. They were always headlining arenas. They were always a big act. But they weren't a cultural fixture the way that they would be subsequently after the Razor's Edge and after they were canonized. And suddenly everyone loved ACDC, not just the scrappy shop kids and headbands. And yes, it was the fucking headbangers that stuck by ACDC throughout the fucking 80s. But by the time we got to the mid-90s and late 90s, yeah, everyone loved fucking ACDC. You'd see actresses wearing ACDC shirts and people would bring babies to ACDC concerts. And, and they became a more acceptable canonized band. Anyway, so that's me, Eddie Canastracci talking about fly on the wall and blow up your video. Blow up your video and now breaks my top 10. Yeah, that was bullshit making it 13. Yeah, that's right. But blow up your video, it's a top 10 album. It's a fucking album for super studs. Fly on the wall is even better, even better. Even though the songwriting's not as good and the lyrics aren't as good, it's just overall just sounds more awesome and it's more ass kicking. And ultimately, that's what I love most about ACDC is their awesomeness and ass kickability. Cheers. And until next time, rock on!